The Theology, Medicine, and Culture Initiative at Duke Divinity School convened a gathering in March 2017 titled Taking Our Meds Faithfully, Christian Engagements with Psychiatric Medication, supported by the McDonald Agape Foundation. We invite you to join us for some of these conversations. Hey, I'm Brett McCarty. I'm a doctoral candidate in theological ethics here at Duke Divinity School, and I work closely with the Theology, Medicine, and Culture Initiative. And it's a great joy to be joined today by Therese Lysalt, who is Professor and Associate Dean at the Institute of Pastoral Studies at Loyola University, Chicago, where she also uh, teaches at the Niesvanger Institute for Bioethics in the Stritch School of Medicine. So thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, thank you for inviting me both to uh, talk to you and to the symposium. Yeah, great. So I'd love for you to take a moment to give us an overview of your research and, and maybe how that intersects with questions around psychopharmacology. Since oh, roughly 1992 or so, I have um, tried to focus on the interface between uh, theological resources, theological ethics, and questions in medicine, both kind of the ordinary practice of medicine and then emergent sorts of issues and questions. Um, especially for me, um, as they interface with um, lay folks, people in parishes. Um, I'm not a physician, um, uh, I'm a theologian, uh, and so I occupy a space that's more uh, an ecclesial space rather than a hospital space. Um, and so I try to think about these questions from the perspective of what is it like to be a patient? What is it like to encounter them? And as a theologian, and you're Roman Catholic, um, so there's a long tradition of uh, deep connections between the church and the practice of medicine that are, I'm sure are helpful for you in making those connections. Right, a long tradition that many people in the, uh, the church, both Catholic and Protestant, don't know. Um, but from the very, I mean, we all know the Gospels. So, you know, from the Gospels forward, um, uh, significant attention to how um, God in Jesus meets us in these places of pain in the world, especially uh, in places of sickness. Um, uh, but that continued on after the Gospels and was a, um, a really um, key emphasis of the early church. Um, and then as the church persisted through the um, uh, the Middle Ages um, and through most of Western history um, uh, embodied this deep commitment to caring for the sick. Um, some sociologists have argued that uh, it was um, Christians care for sick people both within their own communities and outside their communities that really fueled the rise of Christianity because uh, in some ways Christianity is a weird religion. Why would you sign up for this? Um, but they saw this really concrete practice of God's care for people embodied in these strange Christian folks, and that was attracted to them. Uh, and very early within the church's history, fourth century or so, Christians uh, began founding what became the precursors of hospitals as we have them today, and then they continued that whole tradition uh, through Western history. Uh, but most people don't know that. Uh, and you get to be at uh, the intersection of reminding them of that in creative ways today. Right, uh, because it continues today, um, you know, mostly through institutionalized practices of uh, health care. Uh, and Catholic health care in the United States um, comprises about 15% of uh, health care delivery in the United States. Um, but they also comprise a huge percentage of um, long-term care, rehabilitative care, um, care for people with mental illness, which um, uh, is poorly reimbursed. So, you know, not many folks are interested in, in doing. Um, uh, so trying to support that, the work of the church in that form, that's, that's part of what I do. Yeah. So in the first part of your paper for this conference, you describe some of the reasons why psychiatric medication may not be sacramental in the sense of uh, sacramental being a kind of means of grace. And I was wondering if you'd say a bit more about that. Yeah, well, so, um, so y'all asked me to reflect on this question of, uh, you know, 
could or are uh, psychiatric medication sacramental? And, you know, when I saw that question, I was like, really? Hmm. Why? I don't think so, but let me think about that. Um, uh, but there are a number of, um, I mean, on the one hand, a lot of people take psychiatric medications. A lot of Christians take psychiatric medications. A lot of people who are sitting in congregations take psychiatric medications. So it's really important to start a conversation about how do we think about these theologically or in terms of our Christian identity or in terms of faith. So, um, so I think it's a, um, it's a really interesting and important question. Um, but on the other hand, um, why do so many people take them, right? Uh, and why do so many people take them all of a sudden? This is a relatively recent um, development within even our own, or even our own lifetimes. Um, uh, and they seem relatively, you know, on the one hand, they seem relatively innocuous, uh, or they seem really positive, right? They have these um, uh, sometimes transformative effects on people, right? Which makes us want to say, oh, that must be grace, right? There's something good there. Um, but when you step back from the medication itself and kind of look at the broader context, uh, there are, I think, uh, some questions that at least need to be asked, you know, on the face of it. We really still don't have a very good understanding of the causes of mental illness. A second piece related to that is we're not quite sure how the medications affect the illness. Like we understand certain biological effects that they have, but not how those biological effects relate to the cause of the illness. Second, um, as many people attest who take these medications, there are some pretty significant side effects. Um, not, so there's some questions about how these, um, about the, the ethics uh, of these studies and the, even the scientific validity of these studies for these drugs that have been brought to market. Um, We've seen this enormous increase in the incidence of um, mental illness over, let's say, the last 30 to 40 years. Um, how did that come to be? That you know, depending on which uh, survey you're looking at, you know, anywhere from 20 to 35 percent of the U.S. adult population has some sort of mental illness. And then, if you look at some of the kind of market dynamics, you know, correlating with this rise in um, mental health issues has been an explosion in um, the number of people who are on prescriptions um, and the pretty exorbitant profits that are being made um, off of these medications. So these are just sort of contextual factors um, that we need to at least assess, um, dig behind, um, and take into consideration when asking a question like, is this sacramental? So in, in your work, uh, you describe how contemporary bioethics renders us as docile bodies, um, which I just love. Uh, could you say a bit what you mean by that? And how, how does that relate to bioethical debate specifically over psychopharmacology? So, so in your paper, you display some of the ways in which standard bioethics responses to concerns over psychopharmacology don't get at any of the things you just named, and in some ways displays the limit of that approach and the need for theological reframing. Bioethics is often shaped by, um, or is shaped by, you know, three or four fundamental principles. Um, autonomy or choice, um, uh, beneficence, if it's a good thing, um, it better not hurt you, right? do no harm, um, and utility. Right? Uh, is it useful? Are the, do the benefits outweigh the costs? Does it increase efficiency and whatnot? Um, and so, um, so the way the question gets framed is, well, if this pill exists and you autonomously wish to improve yourself, well, you should be able to, right? That's a, that's a way of creating yourself. Um, uh, you don't like some of the traits you have? Well, let's go pick up some of these. So tell me, how, how is the theological reframing helpful for just those questions? Right. Well, so I think one of the questions is, um, well, if we're Christians, there's a lot of recreation that's involved in the Christian life, ideally. Um, but what kind of recreation? And who does it? And toward what end? 
right? Um, so uh, those who are Christians and who see themselves as followers of Christ or Christian, right? We have a particular vision of who we're supposed to become. Um, and for the most part, that's not richer, faster, more independent, right? Uh, it is to become like Christ, uh, to become someone who empties ourselves, not fills ourselves, right? Who is patient, right? Not who is more efficient. Um, one who um, uh, is generous and gives rather than accumulating, uh, and so on. So, you know, we can, uh, who, who hangs out with the poor rather than uh, trying to climb the social ladder to hang out at the country club, right? Um, so the question is, well, do these, um, uh, w where are the medications that make us become more like Christ? Or do they, right? Do they shape us to become this person, you know, in the person of Christ rather than kind of in the image of our culture or some kind of economic independent being. In your paper, you draw from Bruce Rogers Vaughan's recent book, Caring for Souls in a Neoliberal Age. What did you learn from this book and how does it specifically relate to our contemporary context? That is an amazing book. Uh, Rogers Vaughan uh, writes out of 30 years um, in uh, the practice of psychotherapy and accompanying people with mental health issues. Um, but, he, but he talks about how over this 30 years he began to see a change um, in the kinds of suffering and issues that his clients or patients were experiencing. He, he wanted to get a handle on what, what was changing. Um, and, uh, and he argues very persuasively, in my opinion, um, uh, that, that what's happened over the last 40 years, um, partly uh, we can see the evidence of this, both in the, the uptick in the incidence of mental illness that I talked about earlier, um, the increase in the use of medications. Um, he argues that um, our particular um, socio-political economic context that has just sort of arisen up around us. Uh, the, it's referred to often as neoliberalism, or he calls it the neoliberal cultural paradigm, because it's more than just economics. It kind of uh, uh, weaves its way into all aspects of our life. He argues uh, that this kind of works in two ways. On the one hand, so neoliberalism is a very comp complex system. Um, it has a number of commitments, um, and he, he shows historically how uh, the commitments of that paradigm have sort of reshaped the method in psychiatry and uh, psychotherapy. Um, two of those dynamics being one uh, he calls methodological individualism, um, and that's, um, that's a, a commitment that says, oh, the problem is not out in society, it's in you, right? The cause of the problem is in you as an individual, and the solution to the problem should be in you. Um, this has sort of undergirded the biological model of mental illness that we've seen grow really since 1980, when depression was defined in the DSM-4 or 3 for the first time. Um, uh, another one is this sort of commitment to economic efficiency, right? Um, uh, giving you a pill uh, is much more economically efficient, takes less time, takes less money. Uh, than you and I to sit and talk and work my issues out for over a 12-month period, right? So these, these principles of methodological individualism and efficiency have reshaped psychiatry and psychotherapy um, uh, and induced the field to create this new way of understanding mental illness. But then some other aspects of um, this paradigm, um, economic inequality particularly, uh, consumerism, right? Constantly consuming things, radical individualism, um, uh, deinstitutionalization, taking a part of institutions and taking people away from them, um, and so on. He argues that what these dynamics have done is dismember the soul, 
um, both of individuals and of our sort of kind of collective humanity. That's really helpful. So imagine someone who might agree with Rogers Vaughan's broad claims about uh, the relationship between neoliberalism and the need for individuals who are efficient consumers and producers, the relationship between that and psychiatry and psychiatric medication. So they're sympathetic to those claims. But, but they worry about a kind of history of Christian stigmatization of psychiatric medication. And they're like, oh, this is just another instance of that. What, what would you say to that person? A first question is to try to figure out which medications we're talking about and which mental health conditions we're talking about. Um, because I do think that although we use this umbrella term mental illness or you know psychiatric medication, there are really important distinctions between different kinds of conditions. One might suggest that there are uh, differences between something like ADHD and the panoply of different kinds of behavior disorders, especially for children that have been discovered over the last 20 years, um, uh, that in many ways are disorders of the fit between a person and their individuality and a system that's pretty lockstep, right? Um, where's the disorder there? That, is it in the person or is it in the system, right? That's, a, that's one kind of condition. As opposed to something like schizophrenia, right? A long-standing historical condition across various, you know, you know, parts of the globe um, that manifests itself in psychosis. It's a very different sort of thing. Uh, so I think on the one hand, you know, you don't want to stigmatize the use of medication, but we, we do need to be clear on, you know, what illnesses are we talking about? How do they relate to this broader system that, you know, we're buying the critique of this system? So how do they interface with that? Um, and um, particularly for those kinds of conditions, um, that uh, seem to be more clearly products of our neoliberal context, anxiety. It's legit to be anxious. You know, we're not saying that this is a false thing. Um, but if it's produced by this context, then simply medicating it, it's not going to make it go away. Right? It's not going to make it better. It's just going to mask it right, until the pill goes away. So wouldn't it be preferable right, to try to get to the underlying cause of uh, that that condition um, and really address that rather than kind of accepting the medicalization of everything. So in response to Rogers Vaughan's claims, you suggest that the church could be a counter politics to our contemporary context. So uh, say more about that, especially in relation to mental illness. Right, so Vaughn basically gets to the end of his book and he says, well, if there is this sort of political cause of mental illness, then what we need is a political response, right? We need a counter politics. Um, but he's not quite sure where to find it. And, um, and he's very honest about that, right? He says, I come to the limits of my, <laughs> my story here. Um, and he has this, this idea that, well, okay, so a counterpolitics would um, uh, be a collective, right, to overcome this sort of radical individualism. There had to be this kind of collective nature to it. Um, and that it should be sort of the community of the expelled, he calls it, the, those expelled by the system, right, who aren't productive enough, who aren't able to consume enough, who aren't needed for the workforce, who are refugees, who have you know, certain kinds of handicaps that make them they're never going to be productive. Um, uh, he envisions collectives like this being the place where those who are in pain can, can accompany each other, right, in what he calls deep solidarity. Um, and he sees this as a necessary component of authentic healing and therapy and rebuilding of the remembering of the soul. But He's a little dubious about churches, probably having experienced churches. Uh, most of our churches don't look like the community of the expelled. So, so he doesn't quite know what to do with um, the church. But I would argue in response to him um, that, yes, on the one hand, churches need to do a better job at being who they are, being what they are. Um, but that at the center of the life of the church, are these specific things that he outlines uh, are needed in response to this problem. 
um, you know, we hold within the Christian tradition that uh, in the Eucharist particularly, um, uh, the church becomes not just a collective, but, you know, Rogers Vaughan uh, asks for, you know, calls for these collectives to be created, but um, the church becomes a, a community, an organism almost, you know, that we call the body of Christ. Um, through the Eucharist, Christ becomes truly present, we say, um, in the world, in the community, and you know, transforms this collection of people you know, into Christ's body. And in theory, in theology, right, uh, capacitates us to then be like Christ in the world, to live like Christ. Well, when you're living in a particular way, that's a politics, right? So if we are living as people who reach out to the poor, that's a political act. We don't necessarily, well, we didn't used to think of that as a political act, perhaps we do now. Um, if we um, uh, live as people who uh, give of ourselves, give of our money, give, of, you know, give out of our need, um, as opposed to people who are constantly accumulating, right? Those are two different kinds of politics, two different kinds of action. Um, so through Behold, you know, through the Eucharistic heart of the church, we become capacitated uh, to live differently um, and in ways that really respond to the particular dynamics that Rogers Vaughan identifies. How might this uh, transformed Eucharistic community, this counterpolitics, uh, relate to and consider psychiatric medications? Rogers Vaughan doesn't talk that much about psychiatric medications, which I think suggests that it becomes a, sort of a secondary issue, right? So the primary issue is, first, how can the church respond to people with mental illness in ways that begins to address these dynamics um, that have dismembered them? Um, you know, so first things first. Um, uh, this is not efficient, this requires time, this requires being, John Swinton calls this, you know, the practice of friendship um, with um, those who are disabled, expelled, unpleasant, those we don't normally want to even acknowledge or exist. Uh, so I think that the, the first response is to, is to identify, you know, what are the dynamics that have created this situation, address those dynamics, um, and then in that context, back to the patient uh, kind of testimony, um, is there a limited role for psychiatric medication? For people who, um, you know, have serious psychosis, right? It can be very effective in helping tide them over a crisis. Uh, should they be on that medication their entire life, right, so that they're controlled? Uh, right? Discernment needs to enter in. Right? So... How can the gospel be good news in the context of mental illness, psychiatric medication, and care? Well, the gospel, um, the gospel is replete with crazy people. Uh, I don't know if you've read it recently, but um, but it's actually it's a really you know reading the gospel with these questions in mind, you, know, you always find new things. Um, so just in you know getting ready for this um, uh, this event. Um, I had never noticed how many times Jesus was called crazy in the Gospels, right? His family in Mark thinks he's crazy, right? And they want to restrain him and, and take him out of the work he's doing because they're scaring him. He's scaring them, right? The Pharisees over in John's Gospel, you know, say, he's crazy. He must be possessed by a demon, right? So it's interesting that those passages have remained in the scriptures. Why are they there? Great. Well, thank you so much, Therese. Oh, I really thank you, Brett. It's always good to see you again. For further interviews and other resources on Christian engagements with psychiatric medications, please visit our website, tmc.divinity.duke.edu.